it is absolute pleasure to be here today and uh, to have this conversation with you. Um, all through this afternoon, before coming here, I was thinking of Emily. And um, you know she's a poet, but she also does aerials. And uh, if you see her, I wish, I wish now that we had a, a video of uh, those aerials. You know, she goes about 20 feet up and uh, walks on air and makes love to the silk that is wrapped around her. And then she comes down, you know, with her feet firmly on the ground. And when you were reading, Jim, I thought that's what poetry is all about. Mm -hmm. To go up in the air and soar and then come down with your feet firmly on the ground. And that is what Chivitella has done for us, those of us who have been lucky to be here. This is a space where we soar, and then when once we go back to reality, something has definitely changed. And our eyes have changed, the way we look at the world has changed, and for that we're very, I, I, I think I can say we, in this case, and not just I, are very grateful to all of you at Chivitella. Uh, who have made it possible for us to soar and to share this story. And that's why last time I said that when I come to a place like this, you know, my last book was called Republic of Imagination. And people keep asking, what is Republic of Imagination? And this is a Republic of Imagination. Because you can imagine there are people here, fellows, who come from six continents. Not six countries, but six different continents all from different backgrounds, from different areas, uh, and, and yet um, they defy all the limitations that uh, uh, reality imposes on us. Uh, here we don't talk necessarily of our nationality or our gender or our um, uh, religious beliefs or ideological and political beliefs. Here we are all united by passion passion for, uh, for life, because without passion for life, you could not have passion for art. And um, I think the best way that this was explained was Tano. Uh, he said, I enjoy work more than I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that all of us here enjoy work more than we enjoy, you know, and, and, um, and that is the... Um, the secret to being uh, a Chilitarian. Uh, now, uh, when, but unfortunately, in the kind of world today that we live in, they you don't necessarily see, see this passion, although I think it is hidden everywhere and uh, somewhere deep down. To be human is to uh, have imagination and ideas. As Umberto Eco, uh, has said, um, to survive, you need to tell stories. And, 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 and so, imaginative knowledge is not something that you have today, and, and then you don't need it tomorrow because now you have an iPhone. <laughs> imaginative knowledge links us to our past, makes us reflect critically on our present, and predicts the future. So you, you can never get rid of it for as long as you call yourself human. And there are two elements, I think, to imaginative knowledge that are part of our survival kit. The first is curiosity. And uh, Vladimir Nabokov used to tell his students, curiosity is um, insubordination in its purest form. <laughs> and, and I love that. Because, you know, insubordination is not something you do today and then go home and drink your beer and feel good that you um, <laughs> protested in front of the White House. Although, I think we do need to protest in front of the White House. But uh, it goes beyond that, you know. And insubordination is not just against the world. It's against ourselves. That we ourselves as human beings, as individuals, need to pose ourselves as question marks. And that is what literature and art do to us. They force us to pose ourselves as question marks, to question who we are, where we come from, where we are going, these very basic human questions. And curiosity makes you to look at the world through the alternative eyes of others. 
you, when you write and when you read, uh, it is the most boring thing in the world, and unfortunately, at least in the United States, our colleges are constantly doing this. They force you, categorize you, and put you in little boxes. So, for example, if I'm a woman who comes from a place called, uh, by mistake, the Islamic Republic of Iran that was used to call Iran, um, if I'm a uh, woman coming from there, which would be then a Muslim majority country, um, then I should only talk about women from Muslim majority countries. And I remember some of my co colleagues at Hopkins told me, you're so lucky, you're here just in time because women obviously and Muslim countries are very much in fashion. They didn't say they're in fashion, but they said you'd get great jobs. And, uh, and I told one of them, and I wanted to tell all of them, you go and teach women and, and uh, Islamic studies. I want to teach dead white maids. Because the whole idea about literature is to discover the others. To put yourself in the shoes of someone else. To look at the world through the eyes of someone else. And even, I mean, in the novel, you go under the, if you're a great novelist, you go under the skin of every single character, even the villain has a voice. Because even if you're going to defeat someone, you need to understand them. So you come from the position of not judgment, but of understanding. And that alternative, I, I have so much experience in this place with, with so many people. Um, Esperanza taught me to completely look at uh, Wallace Stevens uh, through, you know, complete different eyes. She took a poem that could be very offensive, just the, the um, title itself was offensive, and she made it her own by finding something in that poem that I bet you Wallace Stevens never thought of finding that, you know. And that is why books and art and music, they need uh, active interlocutors. Otherwise, they will wither and die. You know, you need constantly uh, to have people from different parts of the world, different backgrounds to uh, read, see, listen, and by doing that to bring out the hidden corners in art and literature, because that is what art does to life, bringing out those hidden corners, giving, um, you know, uh, voice to all those silences, um, making articulate what is not, what is inarticulate. Um, and then once you have curiosity, I think then you're led to the second uh, important um, factor in keeping us alive, and that is um, uh, empathy. And empathy is used so, in such a corny way, corny, corny, can I say corny? <laughs> corny way these days, you know, I feel your pain type of a thing. It's not really that. Um, it is to be able to look at others through their eyes. And it is the shock of recognition, not just difference. You see, we have these two things that we need to have, we need to have both of them. One is difference to celebrate difference, but without celebrating what we have in common, difference can become very dangerous. Because remember, in the 20th century, um, the Nazis were saying that Jews are different from us. Um, all through the fight for civil rights, uh, even today in many countries, including my home now, United States, they say minorities are different from us. Immigrants are different from us. Yes, they are different from you, and we should celebrate, in fact, that difference. But then there is something that you share, the best and the worst you share. Um, uh, it makes us question what uh, Shylock in Merchant of Venice questions, if you trick us, do we not bleed? Because that mother in Iraq, whose uh, house and children have all been bombed out of existence, or the woman in Afghanistan who's been taken to a football stadium and a bullet put through her head because she was not dressed properly, 
or the woman in Nigeria whose daughter had been kidnapped by Boko Haram, or the mother in um, America or in Italy whose son never came back home from the war, all of them bleed. There is no difference. We all bleed and we are all human and to forget that and unfortunately I think today we are forgetting that. Uh, not we in this room but, but we as um, uh, human beings. Um, so uh, what I wanted to talk about and I am looking at my watch uh, so don't worry uh, uh, is a celebration of imagination and by doing that a celebration of uh, Chivitela uh, for this amazing opportunity uh, that we have been given and I thought that what I would do um, would be maybe tell you the story behind my books and in that way cover the two homes I have had which is uh, in Iran and in the United States in order to prove the, the generalizations that I have been um, making. So if I want to go back to the first book I wrote which was in Persian, I wanted to write about a, a book about uh, Vladimir Nabokov but I didn't want it to be just your normal academic book. I wanted to talk about um, realities um, that I had undergone while reading Nabokov and how my perception changed of those realities through reading Nabokov and how Nabokov's uh, books changed for me because of these different realities I had lived under. And I mentioned maybe last time when um, we were here uh, that uh, I very soon realized I can't write such a book because the first sentence, and I remember the moment when I decided this would be the first sentence of my book, uh, was that I wanted to say the first book I read by Nabokov was Ada, and my boyfriend Ted gave it to me and wrote on the fly leaf to Aza, my Ada loved Ted. Now, it was not just the political aspects of it, it was the personal. Because always personal becomes political under uh, totalitarian rule and uh, with totalitarian mindsets. I couldn't write about having a boyfriend, never mind an American boyfriend from the land of great Satan. And this illicit relationship, if it happened in Iran, could lead to execution, to jail. So uh, it was just not something you write. So, to take my vengeance, what I did, I wrote a book which was a book of literary criticism, but each chapter was about one aspect of tyranny. I mean, Nabokov himself having escaped um, Russia, Soviet uh, Union, was very, very sensitive on especially the issue of um, uh, individual and, 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 and human rights. And so uh, each book became something uh, which would question the Islamic Republic without once mentioning the Islamic Republic. But um, that was not satisfactory really. I, um, in my diary, uh, and I'm a crazy diary keeper, I mean, that's all I do in life most of the time. Um, keep a diary which I cannot read because I cannot read my own handwriting. Um, but um, uh, I, I wrote uh, in my diary under a section things I've been silent about. And I had things that were so bizarre living in the Islamic Republic, like going to parties in Tehran, um, listening to Gypsy King in Tehran, uh, watching Marx Brothers in Tehran, falling in love in Tehran, reading Jane Austen in Tehran, and of course reading Lolita in Tehran. That is that what became the name of um, my next book, uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran, and I wrote it when I came back to the United States. And you know, when, once you have been under um, repression for 18 years, all you want to do is talk. <laughs> Unfortunately for those who have to listen, you know, but... Uh, and I wanted to talk about Iran, and I was so shocked by the view people had of my country. Uh, 
I felt that our images of who we are, our identities, was once taken away from us by the Islamic Republic and once again taken away from us by the images that I saw in the West. Because most of those images were of these men with turbans uh, talking about the Muslim world and talking about Iran as part of the Muslim world. In fact, Iran was the formulator of this theory of a Muslim world. There is no such a thing. These countries, before I left um, uh, for America, the, uh, when I first left America, these countries had names. Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Malaysia, Indonesia. These countries, if you know anything about them, know that they are far more different from one another in terms of culture and history than um, the United States of America and France and Great Britain. And yet, all of them were lumped together and deprived of their names. And name is what gives you individuality, what differentiates you from the other. But now they were part of the Muslim world and re religion that like all great religions like Christianity or Judaism has so many different aspects to it. Right now, as we speak in Iran, the Islamic regime has been jailing and killing and executing um, the members of the most non-violent Muslim group you can find in the world, namely the Sufis, the mystics. Don't think that they only execute and jail seculars or agnostics or Christians or Jews or Baha'is, they do all of that. But they also kill Muslims. Muslims that come from other sects or Muslims that are against the regime. So this is not about religion, it is about ideology. It is like communist ideology, fascist ideology. And it is there to have power. And yet, when I, whenever I talked about, for example, the situation of women in Iran, they would say, oh, it's their culture. And it really got me, you know, when people say it's their culture, and especially in the academia when they theorize um, the fact that this is their culture, you know. And so I thought I would tell you a little bit about the culture. Uh, I mentioned it in reading Lolita. Um, and uh, I thought I'd bring a few photographs to show you something of that culture. Um, before the Islamic Republic, first of all, you all know that Iran is a rather ancient country. I mean, it's got 3,000 years at least um, of history. And uh, half of it was not Muslim, it was Zoroastrianism. Uh, and uh, the kind of Islam that came about in Iran was very much uh, mixed with Iranian Persian, uh, ancient Persian culture and, uh, uh, and traditions. And if you go to Iranian poets, and my father always told me that this is an ancient country and it has been um, invaded so many times that the only identity we have as Iranians, the only thing that connects us with one another is its poetry. And when you go to poetry of our epic uh, poet Ferdowsi uh, in Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, uh, you see women, and there are many women there, who not only choose the men to, they want to marry, they choose the man they want to sleep with and have wine with. Wine in Iran and in uh, mystic poetry in Rumi, for example, or in Hafez, um, is sacred. And I was just told in Milan by this avid Persian waiter uh, who, he said, uh, he, he wants to be a sommelier, uh, he likes wine. And he came to me and said, do you know what they discovered um, recently in Iran? Um, there, there is um, a place near uh, the town of Rezaye, and they have found this, um, uh, I don't know what we say, vase type of a thing, uh, which had wine in it, and they discovered that this is wine and it goes back to 7,000 years ago. So she said, <laughs> he said, this is Persian. 
I mean, they love saying that wine is Persian. You said not everybody says wine comes from Persian. And, and there is a book uh, by many publishers called um, From uh, Persopolis to Napa, which is the history of uh, wine in Iran. And, um, you know, Shiraz, uh, where the name of the wine comes from, uh, always in Persian poetry is the city of wine and nightingales, uh, or wine and roses. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I can go on forever, fortunately, we don't have time to go forever. Um, but what I want to say that, first of all, what endures, as Nabokov used to say, governments come and go, only the trace of genius remains. So governments over these thousands of years since Ferdowsi lived until today have come and gone. We don't remember even the name of most of them. But we sure as hell remember the names of Ferdowsi and Hafez and Rumi and Ovid and Lucretius and Moliere and, uh, uh, well, Toni Morrison is very recent, but still Toni Morrison. <laughs> um, and W.H. Auden and, you know, I, think I can go on forever. We remember them because these are the ones that give us our true identity. You know, and uh, so I'm not very much worried about um, poetry leaving us because Trump is here or um, because our schools have decided not to teach art and poetry and music in public uh, elementary schools. It will come back. Uh, and Iran, the, the first thing that the Islamic regime um, targeted was uh, women, minorities, and culture. And that is always what any uh, totalitarian mindset, no matter where in the world they live in, they uh, always uh, uh, target. And, and, and they brought first censorship, then they changed the laws about women. Now, Iranian women have over 150 years history of struggle. The first woman who unveiled in Iran goes back to 1836. She was the precursor of a new religion called Baha'is, and Baha'is in Iran today are treated like Jews in Nazi Germany. They have no rights. Just recently, again, there were um, uh, news of their executions. Um, uh, but uh, by the time of the revolution, uh, we had uh, six women in parliament, one of them my mother. Huh. I'm so technologically challenged. <laughs> I amaze myself. Okay, I just wanted to show you, this is me at five years old. So when I was five, my mother looked like this. Now, she was a member of the Iranian parliament. She was one of the first six women who went to the Iranian parliament in 1963. 1963 is um, 11 years before women in many Swiss cantons uh, got their right to vote in 1974. We forget that uh, um, Susan B. Anthony, when, when we talk about uh, Sojourner Truth and Susan B. Anthony and uh, all these um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, all these Harriet Topman, all these great women, we forget that women did not have the right to vote in the United States until 1920. That they were also said that, we, that women's place, Bible says that women's place is at home. In the same way that Bible somehow thought that slavery is a good thing to have around, you know. Uh, so these rights are not, culture is not something that doesn't change. We all have the right to fight what is terrible and what is bad, and that's what Iranian women did. They didn't look at the West and say, oh, how amazing the British women, who by the way, I mean, the British women at that time had a very hard time of it, and, and in terms of property, uh, uh, American women were fighting for that uh, for a long time. Anyway, 
so this is how she looked. Now you can tell this is how I looked. This is me with my students. You can tell one from the other, most probably. This is how I looked so many decades after. That tells you a lot. By the time of the revolution, we had two women ministers. One minister for uh, higher education, who was the, my uh, school principal, and they executed her. Because she was a woman, they, they put her, because she, her books, uh, the school books were feminist. Uh, they uh, accused her of warring with God and prostitution. And they put her in a sack, that's how the story goes. They either stoned her to death or uh, um, shot. Uh, shot her to death. Uh, I always uh, imagine her death constantly, of how she, her last moments were. And the other one was Minister for Women's Affairs, uh, the second in the world next to France to become Minister for Women's Affairs. So this is how women were in Iran before the revolution. The first thing that the Islamic regime did after coming to power was to uh, annul the family protection law, which gave uh, women protection both in terms of their family and at their jobs. Then they tried to change the age of marriage for women uh, from 18 to 9. Yes. And then women fought a lot for changing it and finally from 9 they raised it to 13 but still the judge can decide that a girl less than 13 uh, can get married. Uh, they brought something that Iran never had which was stoning people to death for what they called prostitution and adultery. Now on one hand prostitution and adultery uh, were uh, being punished this way. On the other hand, they made temporary marriages legal where a man could rent a woman from five minutes to 99 years old. So uh, I tell those friends who tell me it's your culture that if that is my culture, then um, inquisition and fascism and communism is the culture of Europe. And, and not uh, as great philosophers and writers and artists and, and, and musicians. If that is my culture, then slavery is the culture of um, the United States and not uh, Flannery O'Connor and Carson McCullers and calling all uh, writers from the, the South, um, William Faulkner, uh, they are not the culture it is, that, that is what is their culture, because every culture has something to be ashamed of. We don't have one single nation in this world that is not guilty of something. Nations are built on cruelty. But every culture has the right to change. And that is what uh, uh, is troublesome. I want to go very fast here. Um, I just wanted to end this part about reading Lolita and, and um, uh, Iran uh, by uh, showing you two more photographs. The way Iranian women resisted was amazing because they refused to go into the domain of the regime, speak that language, act that way, uh, act violently. They decided to uh, resist the laws in their own way. And what they did when I was in Iran, I remember I would show this much of my hair. And uh, I always think, and I used not to wear lipstick, or at least I used to wear pink lipstick, but as soon as I went to Iran, I learned to wear lipstick. <laughs> because it was a way of telling them you haven't won. You know, uh, and uh, of course, I think a man who looks at my hair and goes nuts sexually should really be in the hospital and not wander around. Uh, um. So, uh, rather than it being a, um, uh, an insult against women, it's an uh, insult against men that they can't control themselves. And it shows how powerful women are, you know, uh, that my scar 
would mean whether the Islamic Republic stays or goes. You know, it's become a symbol of, 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 of the state. And so Iranian women first started by showing a bit of hair, then it went like this, then they really wore these sexy uniforms, uh, which were far sexier than if they wore nothing. And then they started taking pictures of themselves without taking the veil off for a second and taking pictures. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Diego, do I have... No, no, we have time. I, I will finish. Them. You can start coughing. That means you're bored. <laughs> and I will shut up. Okay. Um, you see, that is her, her job. That she's holding in her hand. She's taking, and then Iranian men started wearing scarves <laughs> in solidarity with women. Now, the whole point is that you can take a political group or the leaders of a political group and put them in jail and kill them all. You can disband organizations, you can censor people. What are you going to do with millions of young people who become, because um, if you show your hair or do what they're doing, uh, it has the punishment of 86 lashes, up to one year in jail, and monetary fine. Now, what are you going to do with millions of young people who come into the streets and do this? You can't put all of them in jail. And these are children of revolution. They're not me. They, they were born in this revolution, and that is how they're resisting the regime. And almost every month, there are people from within the system that join the opposition. So many women who wore the veil at the beginning are taking it off. And, I'm not, and, and the veil is not an issue of religion again. It is an issue of freedom of choice. What I believe in is that no power on earth has the right to tell a woman, first of all, to worship God or not, and second of all, how to worship. It's our choice how we want to worship God, or not. And, and that is the issue, and that is why a country like Iran, and uh, in a different sense like Saudi Arabia, becomes so important, because it is so much about freedoms. Uh, and it is a reminder to us that these freedoms have been bought very dearly, and they are being uh, forgotten. Uh, very easy, unfortunately, in uh, democratic countries. Uh, so, for us in Iran, um, resistance was not political. It was not ideological. It was existential. If I, as a woman, as a teacher, as a writer, as a uh, person who believes in human rights, if all these rights are taken away from me, if my individuality, because the subject of veil is when I wear that veil, all my movements change. I feel, you feel complicit. You know how victims feel complicit? Because this is not you. And yet you go into the streets, and that guy in militia who's standing there making sure you wear your veil knows, and you know that this is not you. And yet you do it. So they make you feel guilty about something that they have imposed on you. And so it becomes existential. And one other way that we survived was they took the world away from us. We connected to the world not politically. It's impossible to do that anyway. Uh, we connected to it through its golden ambassadors, through Hannah Arendt through Karl Popper, uh, through Emily Dickinson, you know, through Jane Austen, through, uh, through music, uh, through, from the doors and Bon Jovi to the to <laughs> rap and <laughs> they arrest young men for wearing rap hairdo. I don't know what rap hairdo is, but uh, <laughs> definitely in Iran it's very fashionable. So, uh, I would like to uh, finish by coming to America, and uh, the last book that, well, in between I wrote 
the things I have been silent about, actually, which is a memoir. I, want, I was interested in intersections between uh, public and private, political and personal. And uh, so I put it within the framework of um, my family and uh, life in Iran. And in one way, saying goodbye to both my parents uh, who had died, and I had felt that there was a con conversation that had gone and, and, and finished, that I needed to finish the conversation with the country I left and with my parents. And so um, that was uh, the story. And the last one, uh, Republic of Imagination, is a twin to Reading Lolita in Tehran. At the end of Reading Lolita in Tehran, I was very worried that my students would get too um, beautiful image of America. They, all they wanted to do was to go to America. And, and that is why I taught them Saul Bellow. Because I, they need to look at it critically. I mean, if you love a place, you look at it crit critically. Because you want to change. You want it perfect, you know. And so, uh, I just want to make, uh, uh, obviously I, I would have never become a citizen if I hadn't loved the country. And obviously I would not have loved the country if I did not criticize it, and that's why I wanted to become a citizen, in order to change it. Uh, so, uh, I just very s shortly go over the things that bothered me in that book, but that book came out in 2014. We didn't have the specific thing that is happening here. But these are the issues that bothered me that I mentioned in that book. One was, the first thing was this collapse of illusion and reality. That uh, the, it is like reality show. Uh, that life became a reality show at some point in America. The same way that it did in Iran, where I felt I wasn't me. I was feeling that this is not <laughs> how things are. Uh, I mean, you are all familiar with the concept of fake news and alternative facts. That was one aspect of it. Those who ruled were giving us alternative facts. The other aspect of it that is that when you're put in that situation, you want to escape. You, you escape reality, you go into fiction, the news comes, you turn it off. You don't read headlines. Um, Trump's voice makes you go nuts and want to drink a lot of cappuccinos alongside of um, margaritas. <laughs> so uh, that was what uh, I, I was really concerned with. And, and alongside of that, then consumerism becomes very uh, easy. Uh, you go after Nike instead of, uh, you know, <laughs> doing a number of other things. Uh, and uh, look at our candidates. This last election, I, I mean, it is so brazen talking about packaging a candidate. And, and brazenly talking about how a candidate should actually lie and change his beliefs in order to win. You know, I mean, they packaged uh, Clinton and, well, Trump uh, cannot be packaged, I don't know what, what, what he was, but they packaged them the way they packaged toothpaste. I mean, you know, uh, with, uh, in all the ways they went. So that was one thing, and, and, and of course, everything had to be an, an element of quote-unquote entertainment uh, into it. The second thing, which was very, which I think is very, very essential, was this desire to be comfortable. You know, how people constantly say, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, bloody hell, you better get used to it, because this world is really not a comfortable place, you know? And it's too bad that you're not comfortable with it. And you're not comfortable with reading Huckleberry Finn. How are you going to live in a world where Syria exists? Or the prison next door exists? You know? This is really this issue of comfort um, is so, so very wrong. And ideology comes out of that desire to be comfort. Because 
The others are all black hats and you're all white hats. So you don't have to think. Thinking is hard and complicated and ambiguous and makes you really un uncomfortable, you know. And I just tell every college nowadays that I speak nowadays, I quote James Baldwin, one of Esperanza's and my um, favorite authors, uh, where he says, artists are here to disturb the peace. That is exactly the role of art and literature. Not to offer comfort, not aspiring for the soul, um, not how to, you know these how-to books, how to deal with the death of the beloved, how to, it is not that, it never brings closure. But it makes you uncomfortable, thank God. And ignorance is comfortable. And I wanted to end by two things. One, to say that this, this ignorance, everybody is talking about post-truth, that truth is uh, forgotten. And that is the whole point, because truth is the most dangerous thing in the world. Uh, Baldwin called himself a witness. He said, I'm a witness. As a writer, uh, you guys know better than I do, as a writer, as a poet, you are a witness to the world. And you have to see, say what you see. You have to reveal the truth. And truth is dangerous because once you know it, you cannot be silent anymore. The readers also become witnesses. And it is very, very uncomfortable. And that is why today we are constantly evading the truth. And, and, and ignorance has become a way of life. How can you vote for a candidate without knowing your own history? Without knowing the Constitution, without knowing the, what the founders believed in, without knowing about civil rights, without knowing about the civil war. How can you connect to the world without knowing about that world? And yet here we are, you know, ignorance has become a way of bliss and we have to do something about that. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, come just to thank Chibitella by coming to this last point that uh, I will dedicate this part to you. Uh, for my new book, I have been telling our friends here, fellows, um, there's this anecdote by um, Strindberg. Uh, uh, they say that he was in a bar and one day and uh, uh, this guy comes to him and challenges him to a fight and they go out to fight, and in the middle of the fight, Strindberg tells him, I'll meet you in my book, you bastard, and, and walks back to the bar. And, uh, and uh, I, was, I wanted to write about enemies, about how we have forgotten to deal with enemies. Uh, we eliminate them, but we don't engage with them. And if democracy is anything, it is a a variety of voices, a lot of them opposing voices. So the need for enemies and how enemies become intimate, how they go into your mind and stay there if you don't deal with it. You know how in America nowadays everybody is constantly thinking about not thinking about Trump. <laughs> so even when you are against them, they are winning because they are playing games in your mind. Uh, so I thought, and, and one aspect of enemies, I won't go into that, came to me when I was in Italy, when I was in Rome, and thinking about the history of Persia and Rome, and how they were such great enemies. And they were great enemies because they learned so much from one another. When you go to a museum like the Smithsonian in uh, Washington, D.C., you see that the artwork between Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, you can't tell the difference, that the artifacts are so much the same. So governments did go, but the art endured. And uh, I wanted to end with a video, and I just say something uh, about the video so that I shut up and not talk after the video. Uh, this is a video of some, uh, well, I chose it because uh, today, America and Iran, the governments are enemies, you know. Mr. Trump is anti-Iran and uh, Mr. Rouhani and Khamenei are anti-everything, uh, including America, that they call the great Satan. Uh, 
Um, but the Iranian people, one way that they resist is through connecting to the world through its culture. And this is a video of young Iranians singing uh, Farrah Williams is Happy. <laughs> and uh, one thing I wanted to tell you about these young people is that the first thing is how they connect to the world. How we young people around the world are all the same. I mean, not boringly the same, but uh, you know, in a nice way. And uh, the, the, the thing about it is that um, they got arrested right after they made this movie, mm -hmm. uh, this video which went viral. Uh, I always tell uh, the American students to remember that these rights we take so much for granted. Uh, in other parts of the world, people go to jail for them. And uh, I wanted to end on a note of hope, and I mean hope in the same way that Basla Pavel means hope. He says hope is definitely not optimism. It is doing something for the sake of doing it and knowing that it has some meaning regardless of the consequences. And this is what this video is about. It is about hope. These young people have been flogged and jailed for their individual and for their cultural rights. And for me, they are the hope of Iran's future, but um, uh, anyway, so...